I'm Bonnie Efros, and I direct the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere here on campus, and I'm also in the history department. Um, my specialty is medieval history. And I'm Sophia Acord. I'm the associate director of the Humanities Center, and my disciplinary home is sociology, uh, where I study higher education. So um, essentially, we got the green light to go ahead from the dean's office uh, with funding. So we want to acknowledge funding from the dean's office of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and also from the Office of Research, uh, which is uh, supporting more grant writing activity uh, in humanities. And what we're trying to do is sort of fill a gap that exists between the different entities on campus that already exist uh, to, to support grant writing. But uh, one of the areas in which we've found uh, there seems to be a, a hole is in terms of uh, the humanities themselves. And perhaps graduate students and postdoctoral fellows in particular. Yes. Thank you for joining us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a few orders of business. There are two large trash cans outside the door. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you have any trash, that's where it can go. The restrooms, if you don't know, although you probably all live in the library, uh, are right outside and to the left down the hallway. And otherwise, today our, our event is split really into two halves. Um, Professor Efros will begin um, speaking about uh, the why apply, how to think about uh, funding in your graduate career, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll speak in the second half and talk about more specifically concrete strategies for grant writing, how to think about beginning your proposal, getting feedback on it, et cetera. Um, I think we welcome questions anytime at any point. Please just stick up your hands. Uh, let's make this very informal and conversational. In fact, one thing we might start, which helps us as well, is to have everybody introduce themselves, say what department you're from, and also at what stage you're at, uh, whether you're a master's student, a doctoral student, and if you're a doctoral, are you in the writing stage, the research stage, or um, preparing for exam stage? That would be helpful so that we can sort of hear our comments. Because <laughs> they're mouthful. I'm Anastasia Kozak, and I'm an English master's student. My name's Aaron. I'm a history PhD, and I'm in the writing stage. Yeah, I'm Richard Henry, and I'm a, a doctoral student. I just started uh, in French. Uh, Timothy Mesh, I'm a first year PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. I'm Andrea Wilson. Uh, I'm a first year student working on my master's degree in philosophy. I'm Chris Benora. I uh, actually just finished my master's in history, but I'm the assistant at the Center for Humanities. Hi, my name is Yan Wen, and I'm a third year PhD student in English department, and I'm just working on my dissertation right now. Uh, I'm Wiley Lenz. I'm working on my PhD in English, and I'm in the writing stage. I'm David Blairmore. I'm a second year PhD student in English department, and I'm in the very beginning of so I'm a PhD student in anthropology, um, currently teaching in the exam stage. Um, Megan, I'm a PhD student in American history, and I'm in the uh, pre-exams, but by the grade stage. I'm Beth Dixon, I'm a PhD in English, uh, I'm getting a PhD in English, um, and I am about to take my exams in this semester. Right on the <laughs> Why go after external grants? Uh, 
Well, one, there's no money internally. Um, <laughs> but the second is that I really would like to have a break from one more family dissertation. Okay, so yeah, sorry. Um, my project involves people who are outside of the US, like, yeah, kind of desperate. Right, so, so, so some of the incentive exists in that there's a shortage of funding here, or the funding that exists here may not be enough to do what you want to do. For instance, in the case of travel, they may offer small grants, but not enough to get you where you're going or to stay there for a while. Um, and uh, you want free time to be able to write, because many of you are employed by your departments doing a lot of teaching and other activities, which may impede the writing process because you don't have those blocks of time that are really, really useful uh, for getting pieces of your dissertation done. So, um, and what are some other reasons? Why, why else might you think about um, external funding? Uh -huh. You're like um, the job market, to be able to show that you get grants. Yeah, the job market is tight and it's very, very competitive, and uh, particularly in the humanities. Now, not to say that grant writing is easy and that you're just because you apply, you're going to get something, but if you don't apply, you definitely won't get anything. So. Um, so it offers you an opportunity to uh, tap into some resources, and also it, it proves a, a, a very successful way to uh, boost your CV, right? In other words, to make you a standout on the job market because you may have ex internal funding, but what a lot of uh, uh, universities or other job prospects will also look at is has this person been vetted by anybody else? His or her committee says this person is great, but have they applied for any national type scholarships, okay? And this is important in terms of thinking about ways in which you can distinguish yourself from your colleagues. And also, ultimately, it'll allow you the time and space, uh, hopefully, to do better research and to write a more thorough dissertation because, of course, if you go into the academic field, the expectation will be at some point you're gonna turn your dissertation into a book. And uh, the more you have done on your dissertation, because dissertations often get signed off on when they're less complete or more complete, um, this will be less work for you as you go up for tenure. And this is important to think about as well as sort of the long-term prospects. And the other thing to keep up in mind as well is that the more, the more uh, grants that you have, the easier it will be to get future grants because people will look at your CV or your resume and say, hey, this person has already been validated by these organizations, we might want to give funding to. Now, some people may say, this person's had enough funding, we don't want to give any more, but that tends to be more on the side of what happens within your committees here, right? In other words, as the department's trying to make decisions about who to give funding, they'll say, this person's already had a lot, let's try to give it to somebody else. But that's not the way usually that national or international bodies work. They want the most prestigious person possible. So it's also a way of building up um, a track record. And finally, with a slow job market, grants are a way of extending your time. Right? either before you earn your degree or afterwards through postdoctoral fellowships that you can find gainful employment. It's better than being a frequent uh, a freeway flyer, I guess is the term, um, and sort of patching together different jobs because a postdoc can also give you the opportunity to build your CV further. And we can talk about that more um, at the end. And this is something that was already raised, is the issue of, of travel for research. Many of us um, need to go abroad to do our research. I know in my case, I needed to go to France because that's where the archives I needed were. And many of you may need to go to places within the United States or to have uh, an opportunity to spend some serious time with documents. Now, as things get digitized, it may be less necessary to do this, but I know in my area, there are still things that are not going to be digitized anytime soon. And so uh, the ability to travel to these places is absolutely crucial. Um, so it could mean access to a library or an archive, and many libraries and archives do have specific grants that allow you to uh, uh, use their space, to use their resources. And I know myself, having had a postdoc, it allowed me to uh, publish more articles and be a stronger candidate on the job market than I was with just my PhD. In other words, it buys you that extra space. It's seen as um, a good use of your time, as something positive, that that adds to your experience, and as the job market has gotten tighter in the past few years, you may, when you get out of your, uh, when you finish your PhD and you go out on the market the first time, you'll find you're competing against people who've been out there for three or four years, that they have a, a longer list of articles, they've taught more classes, uh, that they've created, not just as teaching assistants,
assistance. And so this can be a really important way to sort of um, improve your, camp your chances uh, at a shop. Also, the thing that I haven't mentioned, too, is about the opportunities for networking. Because frequently, when you have these fellowships, you're not the only person who has these fellowships. So you'll go to a certain institution, or whether it be a university, or a library, or an archive, and you'll meet other people in your field who are doing the same thing. And, and many of them are senior people as well. And they can ultimately become letter writers on your behalf, because the further you get from the PhD, Essentially, you'll be expected to, to, to create sort of a new group of people, not just from your home institution, who will write for future grant applications for you, for jobs, things like that. And so finding these kinds of mentors who work specifically in your field, perhaps even closer than your own advisor, this is also a very useful opportunity that's offered by the opportunity, whether you do um, a pre-doctoral or post-doctoral grant, so that you can network with scholars inside your field get new ideas perhaps, bounce your ideas off other people. This can be a really valuable contribution as well. But I do want to warn you, be prepared. Humanities funding is incredibly tight. It's tighter than it is even in the sciences. And uh, the competition for these positions is stiff. And so if you want to apply for them, you should put your best foot forward. In other words, you should be prepared in doing so. This shouldn't be something that you do I mean, sometimes there are last minute ones that you find out about, but you should be thinking about this process well in advance so that you can write a stronger application. And this is really uh, important. So, one of the most important questions then is how do you find out what there is? What's out there that will help you uh, to achieve this goal? Now, one of the first places you always start is with your mentor, with your advisor, or people on your doctoral committee or your master's committee and say, hey, what grants are out there that I should be thinking about uh, applying for? One way to find out is to look at people's CVs. If they posted them online, where did your mentor go as, uh, in terms of having fellowships? Uh, where do people in your field tend to go? Where, where are the collections that make most sense to go to? So start close, I think, is uh, a good way to do it. Another re important resource, of course, is the graduate advisor in your department who may have more general information about the field, even if he or she is not in your specific area. Also, many departments here on campus have developmental activities which talk about these kinds of grants. Um, most grants in the humanities, at least at the stage you're at, are individual grants as opposed to sort of team-type science grants, although that's starting to change with the digital humanities. But largely, this will be a question of you putting your research out there and going either away for a few months, a few weeks, or um, for longer. And so you want to find out what kinds of opportunities are there. Another way to find out about these is by joining the professional society to which your field is affiliated, whether that's the American Historical Association or the MLA or um, the American Philosophical uh, Society. All of these are professional organizations that can help you to network, and many of them have websites that have grant information, extensive grant information about grants available in your field. These are probably the most uh, obvious ones, but I wanted to give you some other ideas as well. So, um, sometimes departmental websites will have links to grant information. Um, another one, and this one is kind of random, I have to admit, is the one that's put up by the graduate school. They have external grants listed under financial aid, which is not traditionally the way that these things are thought about. And it seems to be sort of random in terms of the listings. It seems to be whoever has contacted the grad school with this information, they then post it. It doesn't look like they are um, putting a big effort into creating a real website that has this information. But sometimes there is interesting stuff on this particular website. They also list internal web, uh, grants. Um, in other words, opportunities that are available here on campus. Often what they'll do is republicize what different uh, offices here on campus are letting people know about. For instance, I went to the website, I think on Friday, and they were listing a lot from the Center for European Studies. So it's kind of random though. It depends who's contacted them and said, hey, can you post our information here as well? So. The difference being that these are the external ones, so this is about opportunities outside of the University of Florida, 
And internal grant opportunities are things that are available here. For instance, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences has some grants. Different centers, like the Center for African Studies, Center for European Studies, um, have things like FLAS grants for language acquisition, which pertain to people at any level uh, of graduate study. So these are important. Uh, and this is an important place to look, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our own website, which also has information uh, in this regard. And please stop me if there are any questions, too. I don't think I'll go to any of these particular websites, because I'm not sure they're that useful. So. Another very useful website is the, the University of Florida's library website. And um, the site has links to videos about grant writing. I guess we're going to be on one of them ourselves. <laughs> um, and examples of past UF grant applications. This one is really critical. I didn't actually know that this existed till Friday. Um, you can look at past examples of successful proposals that have been made by other UF entities as well as students, uh, particularly the Fulbright grants. Um, maybe many of you are thinking about Fulbrights, um, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about those a little bit later in the presentation, but they are archived in the digital library website. I'm not sure this is going to I don't know if it's that important, but it's an interesting website that has all kinds of information about um, sort of, oh, okay, yeah, maybe just bring it up. But it's, uh, um, it's, it's a nice place to, uh, uh, certainly to start um, in terms of, there, there is a special button for funding in the humanities. Um, this is Besta Farber, who's the library's grant specialist. Um, she is a resource as well. But also you have sections where it says find database, pass UF grant proposals. This was what I was just talking about. Um, so they maintain a list here in the library um, of different opportunities. And you can look at different um, grants um, that have been submitted by uh, UF students. Now these will tend to be the larger institutional ones because they've gone uh, specifically through the university. But perhaps something here uh, will be uh, important as well. Oh, this is memory. Not yeah. Okay. Another resource is um, our own center. Um, Chris Benora has been um, busily putting things on here for the past um, what is it, two years now. Grants, all kinds of grant information. Um, and over the summer, he put a, a big effort into organizing them so that it was a little bit more accessible. We have one page that's listed by pre-doctoral fellowship. And on that, that, that launch page, I guess you would call it, there are different, it's done in different categories, whether it involves a research trip, whether you want to stay somewhere long term, uh, whether you're just looking for something smaller. We've tried to organize them so that it makes sense in terms of how they're organized. And also then we have links from our list to the actual sites where this information is housed. Um, and we also keep relatively current with the due dates and things like that. So um, this is a good place to look. Uh, for those grants that require the PhD, we've listed them as um, sort of postdoctoral fellowships, although this term is very loosely used because of course postdoctoral fellowships sometimes uh, involve much more senior people. Some of them say you have to graduated within the last two or three years, and some of them give a, a longer window. So if you look under the faculty funding site, um, this may be relevant information as well. And those that pertain to both categories, we've tried to list them twice. So we're, we've been trying to keep current, and our list is specifically for the humanities as opposed to some of the other websites. We also have a list of internal opportunities for internal fellowships offered here on campus. Our list is certainly not comprehensive, but whenever we hear about a new one, we try to put it up. So this would be funding from the Center for European Studies, um, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Fine Arts, the Office of the Provost, different opportunities that are available. Some of them recurring, some of them one time only. Um, Sophie has also put together a great page, which is about grant writing, which um, talks about the process of grant writing, how you prepare to grant write, and it also includes other resources that you can use in addition in preparing uh, for this activity. So it's sort of like a, what would 
you say, like a pointers on how to go about doing and things not to do. Um, and she's compiled this mainly, we have, and uh, Sophia will talk about this more later, an, an opportunity to talk about, uh, um, essentially we, we give, uh, we, we offer the opportunity to get feedback on your proposals. And so many of the uh, ideas that are in this grant writing section are from that or from uh, current literature on these topics in terms of how one goes about doing humanities grant writing. Now, for certain fellowships, like the Fulbright, there's already support for this process here on campus. And if any of you have thought about doing the Fulbright, you know that it's through international programs. And um, you can only apply for one country at a time. You can't apply for multiple places in the same year. And there's a process that it goes through here on campus before it's submitted nationally, and then it goes to the international board of the country to which you're applying. Fulbrights are kind of funny this way, um, but they prefer that the campus sort of get a handle on who's applying from that campus and how many there are, and vetting them properly before they go to the next stage, uh, which is different than most uh, grants that you'll come across uh, for either master's or doctoral research, okay? So they're the ones who uh, oversee The other thing I want to mention to you is a, a free service that's office, offered by the Office of Research, and it's a database called COS, and it's free to UF grad students and faculty. I think you just have to put your UF ID in, and it'll allow you to, to do searches by keywords. I've tried it once. It's, I don't know, it's a mixed bag. It turns up lots of things that are totally unrelated to what you do or that you're not even eligible for, but um, it may things that you wouldn't find otherwise, and that's the advantage of doing a search, um, particularly if you're starting with a new project and you're not really sure where to start looking. This is it's kind of a grab bag, though. It's not as refined as looking to a place that specializes in humanities research, is, I guess the way that I would frame it, but it's free, so. <laughs> yes, I'd also add that if you use this, you can also search by things that might apply to you, so if you have family in the armed forces, for example certain kinds of eligibility for things. And this helps to pick those out. Right, so, so it, can, it can be a useful resource as well. The other thing when you're thinking about these grants is, is it a good fit? Does it fit what it, I really want to do? Will it allow me to travel? Because some of these are residential fellowships and they don't want you to travel. Now it may be that you want to go to the place where this fellowship is housed, and that's enough. But there are other projects that involve a lot of travel, and so it may not be a good match. So as you're thinking about these places and you put together the list, you know, think about what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And sometimes applying for, and I would always suggest applying for multiple grants, you know, you can think about different parts of the year could be at different institutions, and uh, these could help you to fulfill that goal. Is it for dissertation write-up? Are you at the right stage? Because don't bother to apply if you're not ABD yet, if it requires that you be ABD by the time that you apply, okay? Or if you're a master's student and it says that you have to be a doctoral student. I mean, these are, these are signals that this is probably not uh, a good fit. And how, how will it allow you to achieve your goal? What does the phrase doctoral candidate mean? Because a bunch of places say doctoral candidate, but they don't specify ABD. So I'm not sure what that Usually means. a doctoral candidate is somebody who's ABD. So um, that'll mean that you've, um, in other words, many, um, uh, the programs will accept you as a doctoral student, but you're not considered a doctoral candidate until you've completed your exams. And that's what we say ABD is all but dissertation. So that's my understanding of doctoral candidate means that you've got, you're, you're basically, you're considered ready to write the dissertation. So you've done your both your, if your department has written, you've done your written, and you've also passed your orals. Some will say that you only need to be a candidate by the time you accept it. And so then you have a little bit more leeway as long as you um, are <laughs> confident that you it, like, uh, Is it uh -huh. okay, I mean, if they don't specify, then is it okay to like, I guess, write? And yeah, and, and that's another thing too, is that you, you should always, if you have questions, I mean, as long as you've looked on the website and you've ascertained that it's not there, is that you can establish sort of a relationship with the person who oversees the grants <coughs> by asking these sorts of questions. But make sure it's not something that could easily be answered by going to the website, because that probably won't make you very popular with them. So. <laughs> Although they're not usually the person
person who evaluates it. Often those are the people, though, who sort of make sure that the applications are complete. And sometimes maintaining this kind of relationship with the grant officer is, is actually not a bad thing at all. Yeah, so you mentioned applying <coughs> for multiple grants, but I'm assuming like somewhat conflicts of your applying for, say, a dissertation fellowship it probably isn't a good idea to apply for two. Oh, I do all the time. Oh, you do I all guess. the time. I say for about every five, six grants I apply for, I get one. So, yeah, I'd say cast your net as widely as possible. I mean, I'll give you my personal story was um, I wanted to go to France to work on my dissertation research. So I applied for a French Fulbright, and I applied for a Chateaubriand, uh -huh. and I applied, but you know what, I just, I said, you know what, I might as well just apply for a day a day, which is the German government grant. Why not? Can't hurt. But it meant I had to kind of recast my project because it meant being in Germany for a year instead of in France. And that's the grant I got. So, I mean, so I, the ones that I always think that I have a good chance of getting, um, often I don't get them. And the ones that I think are the outliers, sometimes those are the ones that come through or the ones that I think I would never in a million years get. Okay. And it'll be that one. So my advice is always apply widely because you just don't know what kind of year it's gonna be, who's sitting on the committee, you know, I work on the early Middle Ages and the Germans claim everything in Europe, so they thought that my project, even though it was really based more in France, was something that they wanted to fund. And I would have had no clue that that was the case. And it completely changed my career because living in Germany, my German got much better. I, in terms of the historiography, I understood my project much differently than had I been in France. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, in other words, yeah, because you don't know what's gonna come through. And sometimes you can also delay by a year, so you can actually put two of them back to back. So sometimes you can negotiate with the, now some of them will say it's, it's for this year only, if you don't, but you can also put on your CV declined, and that's a sign that, yeah, you can say I was awarded this grant and I declined it because I had another one. So that makes <laughs> so, And I've seen, this on, I've seen this on a lot of job applications, you know, for history positions, is, People will say, accepted this grant and decline this one. And that shows that you're you're like hot property because there were two granting institutions that wanted to fund you in the same year. So yeah, I would say don't worry about it. Worry about that problem later, and it's a good problem to have when you're trying to choose between which fellowship to take as opposed to, um, you know, what am I gonna do next year because I've run out of funding for my department and um, you know I'm not gonna be able to write if I'm teaching in Santa Fe. So yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, another question kind of related uh -huh. to this. So I'm thinking about applying for like two grants, but they're both major ones, uh -huh. like for foreign travel or whatever. Uh, but not just travel, but travel and like, sure, staying sure. for like primary research, mm -hmm. uh, primary text research kind of thing. Um, but both of them stipulated that if you, like, you know, if you win one major, uh, if you win this, you can't have one another major one, right. but the timelines are really different. Like, the deadline for one is July 1st, the deadline for the other one is like November. So I'd say apply for both, and then if there's a problem, you let them know, and then you see at that point whether they'll take you or not. I mean, in other words, why prevent yourself from that opportunity? You don't know you're gonna get both of them. Yeah, or you maybe. may not get either of them, yeah. but if you don't apply for them, you don't know. So, I mean, some grants will ask you to honestly put a list of all the other things you've applied for. I know the Chateaubriand does that. They'll say, you know, list everything you, this is through the French consulate, list everything else you've applied for. So you put it down, and then they'll, at the, when they award it to you, they'll say, did you get any of these other ones? And I'd say be honest about it, because you don't want to get into yourself into a position where they see it announced on a website somewhere else. But, and, and also because, of course, that tarnishes your reputation with that granting agency. So I'd say be honest about it, but there's nothing that precludes you from applying for as many as you want. The only ones that say that you can't is sometimes they'll say hey, you can't apply for more than one grant from that granting body. Like Fulbright will say, if you're applying to do a French Fulbright, you can't do a Spanish one in the same year. So, but big deal. So you can apply for uh, another grant to go to Spain uh, to cover both your bases if your project need, you know, requires that you go to both places. Or sometimes what they'll allow you to do is take one, you know, six months of the year and you'll have the other six months of the year. So usually you can negotiate these things, but you know, if you don't have anything in hand, there's nothing to go negotiate, I guess is the way that I would put it. Uh -huh. Just to give you maybe an example, I, I, I want to do a year of field work. I applied for seven grants, yeah. and so they can see some, you know, I get one of them, it'd probably be enough, but yeah, it's, it's sufficient to have to get one of them. So yeah, it doesn't hurt, certainly. Like the 
SSRC IVRF one, for yeah. instance, the it's applicants really to those, yeah, it's incredibly competitive. And so um, people will apply, and you'll see the list of the things that they're applying for. They're applying for six, seven other things. It's just, that's the way this game works, because you never know who's going to evaluate it. There may be somebody on the committee who just doesn't like your work for whatever random reason. So you apply other places as well. I mean, you just don't know. Or there could be somebody with a project that's really similar to yours that gets funded and yours doesn't. So in other words, by casting your net widely, my advice would be, I mean, it's a lot of work. I mean, don't get me wrong. These things are not easy. And to do it well, you have to tinker with it each time you do it to a different granting agency, depending upon what their requirements are. But my advisor used to tell me all the time, so you put you know, 15, 20 hours into this, if you come out with $40,000 at the end of it, it's not a bad hourly wage. <laughs> so it's worth thinking about this, and it's worth thinking about, you know, most of these are due in the fall. So it's worth thinking about it in the spring and the summer, and getting these things written, because once the term starts, you're slammed. You know, you're so busy that you don't have time to think about it. And it's also good, and I'll talk about this in a moment, to let the people who are writing on your behalf Start thinking about it too, because they have to write letters for you um, to support your application. But I'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay? But make sure that that the grant fits. Don't waste the grant reviewer's time by applying for something that really isn't a fit. Like that it doesn't fit the parameters of your project. You don't have the right languages to do what it is you say you want to do. Um, or there isn't a good reason for you to be in that library or in that archive or in that collection, um, that you don't have the permission to excavate in the place that you're going. I mean, make sure that you're, you've got everything that it takes to be successful. Um, you know, make sure if it says doctoral candidate that you've already taken your exams or that you will be and they're scheduled. Um, and another thing you can do on their website, sometimes they, um, very frequently, they will post who their current fellows are. Look and see what kinds of projects they're funding. Do you, can you imagine yourself as being part of that group? Does it fit the parameters? Um, and also, um, you know, I mean, not, that's not to say that yours couldn't be funded if it doesn't look like the others, but is it close enough that uh, there's a possibility? And if it's too much of a stretch, you also, you know, your advisor and people on your committee who write you letters have a limited amount of time. So make sure that you're using their, because. You don't want them to send exactly the same letter to each of these. It does take time to change them. So don't waste their time if there's absolutely no way, either that you would ever get this or that you would um, or that you would even take it. So um, make sure, I mean, in other words, there's things that are long shots that you would take in a heartbeat. Um, so I'm not saying don't rule those out. I can say in my own case that was true. But you do want to make sure that it's within the realm of So I would say in the springtime, keep a calendar of the deadlines. Go to now some of them won't list them until the summertime, but at least get a sense of what the deadline was this year, and then go back over the summer and make sure that the deadline hasn't changed because that does happen sometimes. So you want to make sure that you have the current one, and sometimes also the requirements of the grant will change from year to year. So you want to make sure that your information is current, but at least that way you can start preparing um, your your description of your project. Um, and some of the other material that they may request long before you have to apply. And please, get feedback on your proposal. I can't tell you, and this is, I'll refer to undergrads in this case, how many undergrads come to me and say, oh, I'm applying to grad school, um, can you write me a letter? And I say, sure, and then they give me the proposal, and it's full of typos, they haven't had anybody read it, um, it has no information about what they'd like to study. You don't want to do this. You want to get feedback on your proposal from your advisor, from your faculty mentors, from fellow graduate students. You know, you can circulate them with each other. It's not like somebody else is gonna steal your project if they're working on something totally different. Um, so you wanna get feedback on this so that you are producing something that's polished. Because when your reviewers read these things, they're gonna be looking at a stack of them. And any excuse to toss them off the pile for grammar, those go, right? Because if you're told that you you know, you're given 20 to evaluate and you get, um, and you're only allowed to promote two to the next stage, you're gonna be looking for any excuse to, to erase some of those applications. So what I would suggest is make sure that you're prepared to do this and to do it well. And that we've already talked about improving your chances by applying for multiple grants and make sure that you modify your application to meet whatever the requirements
experiments are of that, and I think Sophia will be talking more about that. And send them in well before the deadline, especially now with electronic submissions. We've heard horror stories about people waiting till the afternoon of the deadline, trying to submit these things, and then the computer crashes or something. So don't wait until the day before or the night before to submit uh, in terms of the deadline. The other reason you want to do this as well is that you want to be able to also contact the granting institution and say, hey, did all my recommendations come in? Because sometimes they won't let you know if only two out of the three made it there. And if you don't submit your application until right up at the deadline, you're not going to be able to ask that question because they'll say, you're not, you're not on file. We don't have you here yet. So there is an advantage to doing it at least a week or two in advance. So if there is some kind of um, a problem with some part of your application or something doesn't come through, like your transcripts, that there's still time to make up for uh, whatever's missing. The other thing is, is prepare your referees for the fact that they're going to be writing for you. Give them sufficient time. Talk to them about your goals and why you're applying for these. So it's very clear that you have a plan in mind. Um, pick them strategically to highlight different strengths that you have, perhaps to make up for holes in your CV, or perhaps a language person who can talk about that aspect of your work, a historian to talk about another aspect, you know, sort of bring these together so that you, you're also, because often they'll ask for two or sometimes three, so you want to make sure that you have sort of different voices who can address your work from different perspectives, or perhaps they're in different fields, but even, I mean, or different areas of your field, um, make sure that you give them the information that they need to write the letter. I can't tell you how many times students will say, write me a letter, and they don't give me anything to, I mean, I don't know what they think I'm going to put in the letter, <laughs> but I want to see their proposal, I want to see a CV, a transcript, and anything else that you think will help your advisor or your one of these mentors to write a good letter for you. Do you think it would actually be good to have someone from outside your department, because I hear a lot of times the grant writing committees are like people in different fields, so. It can be good. If it's somebody who knows your work well, I would say yes. Like they're outside your doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends what your relationship with that person is. Have you taken classes with them? Because if it's somebody who only dimly knows your work, I would say no. Yeah, like, yeah. better to have three people in your department, right, who know your work really well because you've taken seminars. But a lot of time, the external person examiner will be somebody you actually did take classes with who's read your perspectives, who's got a good sense of what you're working on, and yeah, may lend a very different perspective to your work because they see it from a different disciplinary angle. So yeah, I, I don't think that hurts at all. I mean, I think it can be a plus. But you have to do it strategically, and you have to think about, you know, how can this help you in your purpose? Um, you know, uh, one person I think suggested to Sophia, like, put together bullet points, right? Like, what, what aspects of the project should they highlight? You know, it really depends. If somebody knows your work really well, they may be able to phrase it in a way that doesn't sound like they're just imitating your letter. So, you know, I think there it's a balancing act in terms of, but you do definitely want to give them the proposal so that they're writing a letter for the same thing you're applying for. Because like, I'll tell you, sometimes there are big gaps between the recommender's letters and what the student says he or she is doing. And that can be a really big problem too, because it looks like there's, there's lack of communication between the mentor and the student or you know something's going on, the project has changed, or something is out of date. So you want to make sure that these things are in sync. And I'm sure you're all aware of this, but please give notice. Let, give people, I'd say at least a month's time. Look, if they've written a lot of letters for you already, usually they can add another in the stack in a couple weeks' time because it doesn't involve writing a letter from scratch. But writing a good letter for one of these is a time-consuming process. And so you want to make sure that you're giving them enough time and also provide a polite reminder to make sure it's done. If you haven't heard from them saying the letter's gone off, it is polite. I mean, don't nag them and don't send an email like, you know, every other day. But it is fair. Sometimes things fall through the crack inadvertently. Things get busy. So you want to make sure that well before the deadline, you've contacted them again to make sure that this has gone off. And you can phrase it in a way that is not pointed, like, did you write my letter? But say, hey, I just sent in my application. Just wanted to let you know. Make sure. And then you can also then check with the granting body to make sure that your application is complete. So I would advise uh, doing that. And do me a favor. Please write a thank you note. Um, thank them. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal thank you note. It can be an email. But it's nice to let your 
these recommenders know that you appreciate what they're doing. It is part of their job, but it also is a lot of work. And so it's nice to thank them. And it's also a courtesy to let them know what you got. <laughs> because a lot of times we write letters for people, and then we never hear whether they got the grants or not until you you know, you know hear it in a departmental newsletter or something. So it's, it's nice to find out what the outcome was, because then you can know that your letters are effective or that they're they're working, and or and that also this is a good granting institution to send other students to in the future. So this is uh, I think helpful as well. So I wanted to just and this is by no means comprehensive. Just talk about some of the different kinds of grants that exist in the field, and just to let you know um, sort of how uh, the di different granting agencies work. Um, one of the most popular for the humanities and social sciences is called the Social Science Research Council and they have something called an International Dissertation Research Fellowship. And this is to support interdisciplinary research, especially. Um, a lot of archeologists apply for this, not as many historians tend to apply for it, for instance, but they cover all different fields, and, um, and it's for international research. So it can be to go anywhere. The really nice thing about this grant is it doesn't have to be just to go to one place. You can go to multiple places as well. It can allow you to do field work. It can allow you to do archival research. Um, this is um, an incredibly competitive grant, but it's also um, a very uh, important one. And the applications go in in the fall. Um, you, can, uh, you can reapply for these as well if you don't get it the first time around. Um, Fulbright I've already mentioned, so I won't go into a lot of depth here. Um, here's another one, the Deutsches Akademisches Austauschdienst which is the German Academic Exchange Service in Germany. Um, it's very similar to a Fulbright, and in fact, I believe that the two bodies communicate with one another. The thing to know about Fulbright is that the Fulbrights are given out by country, and depending upon how much money that country has put into it, there are different numbers of Fulbrights available. For instance, in the case of France, in the year I applied, there were 11 grants available, and there were 110, I think, German Fulbrights. So, Different countries put different amounts of resources into this, and this, and for instance, I heard this year in the Czech Republic, I think there were three. So different countries have different resources, and depending upon the agreement that they reach with the Fulbright organization, um, there'll be different amounts available. And they're open to people in all different fields, sciences as well as um, humanities and social sciences, so you may also be competing against biologists and things like that, which is a little bit different than the social science research a council which is more constrained in terms of discipline. The Deutsches Akademisches Austauschdienst is sort of the German version of the Fulbright. It's very, very similar. Um, it's very prestigious within Germany, and it also then opens up a whole slew of other grants that you can apply for later on in your career um, as a more advanced scholar as well. So this is, and you can apply for these at the same time. So that's an advantage uh, as well. Can you go to your um, some grants are done through the consulate. I happen to know about the Chateaubriand, but I'm sure there must be other countries that offer granting opportunities through their consulate. It's essentially to promote international understanding. Uh, the uh, consulate, it's mainly humanities types project, type projects. It has to do something with France or perhaps French-American relations. They tend to favor more contemporary projects, although occasionally they do give even medievalist uh, fellowships as well. Um, then there are some that are more specific. For instance, the Mellon Fellowships for Research and Primary Sources. These are grants that are specifically looking at people who want to do um, primary um, sort of archival research. Um, so they're trying to support the sort of uh, niche field. Then there are also grants that are specific to areas like women's studies, um, which will allow you then to do research in that particular field. So, I mean, this is just to give you a sense of um, there are a huge array of different types of grants, but they all have some target audience that they're thinking about. You can try to change the way in which they define that target audience, but you have to have some relationship with it and negotiate that in the process of your, of your application. Um, for instance, the Charlotte Newcomb is a very well-known fellowship for religious studies and ethics. But for instance, in that case, we're talking about just, I think there may be three of them a year or two, three. I mean, it's a very, very small number. So the competition is stiff because there may be as many as 100 people applying for those. 
Um, the Mellon HLS has dissertation completion grants. These are unusual. This is for when you're in the writing stage and you're looking for something to give you that last push so you don't have to TA anymore or you don't have to teach so that you can finish. Now, they don't want you to be traveling during this process. They want you to be finishing, right? So that, which is unusual because most grants are to say they want you to go somewhere and do what you're doing. And there are other grants, though, that say, I mean, it may, they'll allow you to go to a library to finish it if you can't do it here at UF, but it's not supposed to be an archival type of grant. It's rather to allow you just time to write. Huh. Yeah, I have a quick question about that one. I'm so I'm actually interested in it. Sure, sure. It does have like um, $3,000 of funds for research. So like, if, is that specifically they want you to travel? Because that's one thing I heard is they want to just Yeah, so I mean, sometimes when you're writing, you'll find, oh my god, for this chapter, I'm totally missing a piece of something. And so they will allow you at one point to, but if you, say propose to them the same kind of grant, say that you apply, you apply to, say, um, the Fulbright, it's not it's not gonna be a good fit, really. But yeah, I mean, because it always happens. You get to a certain point and you discover as you start writing that you miss something or that it would be really great if you could go back. And so some of, some grants, especially doctoral grants too, will include a research stipend, uh, sorry, postdoctoral grants will include a research stipend that allows you at some point to go away but that'll be a minor part of your application about, you know, because often these will ask for a timeline and you'll have to just sort of describe how you see yourself finishing the dissertation within the, the year because they'll, they want to see that you're really going to finish. Um, so, but you can say, and I would really love to use this opportunity to revisit something that, or something new occurred to me as I was in the process of writing this and I realized, you know, a couple weeks in this archive would really help me fill in some of the holes that I have right now that aren't allowing me to finish this and write a stronger dissertation. Is that sort of answer? Yeah. Um, um, and here are some that are aimed at different parts of the world that I haven't spoken about um, since I've been mostly focused on Europe. But certainly there are the IREX Individual Advanced Research Opportunities. This allows you to go to Eastern Europe or Eurasia. There are a fair number of grants that focus on Eastern Europe, and I haven't, certainly haven't listed them all here, um, but uh, that are, these are sort of niche ones where they'll say which countries they're willing to support. So it may be uh, you know, former uh, Soviet satellite states, or it may, in other words, that research is being promoted in certain areas of the world. There are many grants, for instance, that are specific to China. Um, there are other grants that are specific to Japan or to Korea. So, so the granting agency will let you know uh, what it is. And here I listed one of the ones that's open for uh, Chinese studies. And this will allow, for instance, Americans or uh, those of other uh, nationalities, but not Chinese, to go to China to do research. So it's not supposed to allow Chinese scholars to return home to do research, but it will allow them to uh, engage in Chinese studies, uh, which might not be feasible otherwise because of the funding issues and getting there. Um, some are specific to very narrow fields. I mean, not, not to say that American art is a narrow field, but, but relative to some of these other grants that say any field in the humanities is eligible to apply, the Henry Luce Foundation, which has money, basically what happens is the ACLS, which is the American Council of Learning Societies, has given to the Henry Luce Foundation funding to make this grant possible, and it's specified in a specific uh, specialty within a field. So it's not in the area of art history, but only uh, American art. And then there's a whole different kind of grant, which is called a residency. And these are um, often available to doctoral, but sometimes also master's students level. For instance, I don't know if any of you have heard of Dumbart Oaks. Dumbart Oaks offers fellowships in three different areas. And this has to do with the quirks of the institution itself, because the founders, the Bliss family, collected in three areas. And so these are the areas that the Martin Oaks um, uh, Center uh, supports. So they support Byzantine studies, pre-Columbian studies, as well as garden and landscape studies. So these are the areas in which their library has strength. Um, and this is these are the areas they're willing to fund. Sometimes they're willing to bend the categories a little. Byzantine studies can become late antique studies. But you have to be fairly close to these areas. They're connected to Harvard University, even though they're in Washington, D.C. 
So they also have access to the whole Harvard Consortium, which can be a very big plus. Um, and this will allow you to do um, pre-doctoral residences. They also have postdoctoral uh, residencies. Um, and um, they have summer fellowships, for instance. So this could be also a way of getting into a really good library for a period of three months or so to do research in your area. And of course, they have a museum as well. So if you're a person who works with material culture, this can benefit you in a variety of ways. Another very uh, famous place like that is the Newberry Library in Chicago. They have both short-term and long-term fellowships in humanities. Now, their collection is immense. And it's a little quirky also, and there are certain areas they cover and certain ones they don't. They're very known for uh, Renaissance studies. If you work on the Atlantic world or Native American history, genealogy, these are, this is a place to go. And there are many institutions like this. In Los Angeles, for instance, there's the Huntington Gardens. There may be a manuscript there that you need to see, and you can apply to them, and they also do, I think, American West. Um, so these, this is, though, a target kind of grant. You apply to go there. Sometimes they want to know how many months you need to be there. They'll give you um, either a desk in their library or an office space. Usually the requirements of these kinds of grants is once a week somebody will present a paper. You'll hear a presentation um, on your uh, related to the different projects of the fellows there. So this can be a very advantageous place to be if the collection merits you being here. Okay? Um, another opportunity as well is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, you actually, um, uh, you can be a pre-doctoral or a postdoctoral fellow there. You actually work with the curators in the different departments. So you can, uh, there, there are a whole list of them, but essentially you apply generally, and they'll, they can basically make a match. And this is if the Metropolitan Museum, either the collection or the library uh, related to art history, has something that you would like to work on, this is also an opportunity. For those of you who have ever considered curatorial work, it's also an opportunity to work with curators in a way that's more hands-on than most places you would get a chance to do. Sorry, I finished one step. Um, just a few more. The American Antiquarian Society has short-term visiting academic research fellowships. Again, here too. Um, these are specific fields, and this would take you to Worcester, Massachusetts. The New York Public Library. I don't know if any of you have ever worked there. It's one of the best libraries in the United States, if not the best. Um, it's up there, I'd say, with Harvard Library in terms of the ones I've been to. It's kind of a strange place to work because anybody can work there and you just show your driver's license and you get in. So, you know, there are people who are working on everything from looking at porno sites <laughs> next to you in the library to actually doing real research. And there are usually people uh, that the guards keep waking up because they're sleeping next to you. But they do have short-term fellowships that get you in to see this fantastic um, collection in New York City on 42nd uh, and 5th Avenue. Um, the Schomburg Center Scholars in Residence Program is, uh, is connected to the New York Public Library, but it's very specific in terms of field. It's either African, Afro-American, or Afro-Caribbean history and culture. So these are specific grants that are support to support these areas, whereas this can be basically look at the New York Public Library's website and you'll see the catalog contains a little bit of everything. So really this, this is without limit as to field, whereas this is a much more um, uh, exclusive one. And also a very important one in the field, especially I think of African American studies. This is a place that a lot of people go through um, in the process of writing their dissertation and it's supposed to be a great place uh, to network. Um, another one, if you're an early Americanist, is the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. This is focused on colonial and U.S. history. Uh, American S uh, Society for 18th Century Studies and the Clark Library Fellowships. This is part of UCLA, although not at the UCLA campus. It's closer to downtown. But this is a fantastic place if you do sort of early modern up to 18th century studies. Of course, there's the Getty. It has Getty Predoctoral Fellowships. This is in Los Angeles if you have a project that's specific uh, to uh, the part, something that's in their collection or an ongoing exhibition. This is also a very prestigious grant and um, will support you to do your research. Um, I, I don't think we have any people here who are in architecture or design, right? Yeah? Okay, so I won't spend a lot of time on these, but these are uh, architecture grants for 
travel grants for graduate work. Um, the Crest Foundation Art Fellowship Crest, of course, um, provided many museums in the United States with paintings in the 1960s. And they have grant modest grants that are for art historians, conservators who are trying to learn new methods, um, art educators, and museum curators as a chance to travel as well. And there are specific grants for MFA, but I don't think we have anybody MFA here. Okay. okay, and the last plug I'll make before I'm quiet is to talk just very, very briefly about the postdoctoral fellowships. You apply for them for all the reasons you apply for pre-doctoral ones. Um, what I would suggest is that while it may mean making a, yet another move in the process of your academic career, they do offer you the opportunity to have a reduced teaching load, research support, mentorship, a chance to network so that you make a stronger candidate as you go on the job market. And I counsel everybody on the job market to also apply for postdocs at the same time because you just don't know what's going to come through. And Often these are due before you're going to find out whether it's a good year on the job market or a bad year in terms of the number of advertisements that are out there. And having a postdoctoral fellowship, especially one that emphasizes research, will make your tenure process a lot easier because you'll get a lot of the things done that you can't do if you're preparing, say, three or four new lectures a semester to teach at a new institution. So they give you that breathing space and they give you more time to prepare. Often what the postdoctoral fellowships are, are built to do is to allow you to turn your dissertation into a book. So it doesn't have to be a new project at this point. It's a way basically of furthering your professional development um, and moving along in the process so that you're uh, a more viable candidate for jobs as well as for tenure. Now there are different types, and I'll just mention these briefly. There's some that are more teaching intensive, such as the University of Chicago Society of Fellows. They want to hire people for four years to teach their core humanities courses. Okay, it's basically uh, Western Civ or the, the Great Lit kind of courses. You teach it for four years. You teach two courses a quarter. Um, so it's it's a reasonable teaching load. It'll keep you very busy. But they also give you a sabbatical in the course of the four years, and the pay seems pretty decent to me, fifty-eight thousand a year. Um, you can you can live decently in Chicago on that. I think. I mean, you won't live high on the hog, but. Um, and the kinds of connections you make from doing this will make you a very strong candidate uh, on the job market. The Columbia University Society of Fellows in Humanities is something quite similar, except that it's less teaching. Um, and uh, you also get to design the courses that you're teaching in some cases uh, after the first year. And they also will pay you reasonably well, although living in New York City, um, that amount can be um, difficult. So um, depending on whether you have a family or not, things like that. But, but um, these are things to keep in mind as a way of sort of, if the job market looks like it's not going to improve anytime soon, these kinds of things will allow you that space before you go on the market. Or you, should, you can do both of them at the same time. And if I understand correctly, some people do get jobs before the three or four years are out, and so this is a possibility as well. Now, there are other types of postdoctoral fellowships that are more research focused like the Andrew W. Mellon uh, Fellowship of Scholars in the Humanities at Stanford University is hooked up with the Humanities Center. This is where you're only going to be teaching two courses per year over the course of two years. Um, they list specific departments each year, and you become part of the community of scholars who are at the Stanford Humanities Center. So that's less teaching-based, and that's more about getting you to an institution that has a great library and building up your CV. Um, the ITSOC Walton Killam Memorial Postdoctoral Fellowship is a Canadian grant. It exists at several universities, one of which is the University of Alberta. This is two years of fellowship without any obligation to teach at all. You just get to be in their department, participate in department life, work on your research, and if you do want to teach a course to build up your CV, they will allow you to do it and they'll pay you a little bit more money. And this is, this is Canadian, so Canadian, 44,000 Canadians. Um, and then another place that I just wanted to mention also another kind of place like the, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton or the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study, which is part of Harvard. This, these will be stiffer competition because you're competing against more senior people. This is, um, these grants are not, they're considered postdoctoral fellowships, but they're not limited to people who've just finished. Okay, but this is also something to keep on your radar because if you've got a really exciting new project, they may be interested. They used to be just limited to studies that pertain to women, but 
that's not the case any longer. And um, this is a place, too, that once you have something like this on your CV, this sort of increases your, your chances on uh, the job market. So I know I've rushed through these things. I apologize. But um, please let us know if you have any questions. And um, I'll, right, should we take a break now? Yeah, let's take a couple minutes. If you didn't grab a lunch, please do. If you're still hungry, please grab another one. Grab some drinks. We'll start.